Well, hello everybody and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, um, CloudSoft, a longtime member of the OpenShift Commons that I um, haven't gotten to give a briefing yet. I'm really pleased that they're, they're doing one today and um, they're going to talk about keeping OpenShift evergreen using their CloudSoft AMP. Um, and they've done a lot of work with Apache Brooklyn. I'm really pleased to have Andrew Kennedy on the line. Um, yeah, I've seen him speak many times at conferences and um, he's going to give us um, a bit of an overview of um, CloudSoft AMP and then he's going to do a, um, some real good demos. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, the format for this is, as always, ask questions in the chat. I'm going to try and get um, Andrew to do most of his presentation and then I'll open up the lines um, after he's done. So we have a full hour. We'll see how long he takes to do the demos and everything and we'll pray. But the demo gods are with us. Andrew, I'm going to let you take it away with that. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. So um, what I'd like to talk about here is OpenShift, evergreening OpenShift, and how we can manage to do that using CloudSoft AMP. So first off, a bit about myself. Um, I work for a company called CloudSoft. Um, we are involved a lot in the open source community. As I mentioned, Apache Brooklyn is one of the, the main projects that, that we contribute to. So my work is as a software engineer developing software for Apache, Apache Brooklyn. And we also, also, and we also um, provide that as a commercial product as CloudSoft AMP um, with support, um, Red Hat do, etc. So I'll begin with an introduction to CloudSoft AMP, just explaining what it is, what it can do. Um, it's application management software, so just showing a bit about how all of that works, what it's useful for, in case you, you've never met it before. And then I'll move over to how we can use CloudSoft AMP with OpenShift and the various things that, that we can do there with the, the two pieces of software. Deploying OpenShift, managing OpenShift at runtime, how we do that management and how that lets us do the evergreening, managing to keep our OpenShift clusters running smoothly and up to date. So begin with the introduction to CloudSoft AMP. And it's as I said, it's Apache Brooklyn, it's the commercial version of it, and Brooklyn and AMP were developed to solve various problems. So IT and um, software today, the ecosystems, they're large, they're complex, and they're fast moving. So there are bits of software that are considered essential today that no one had heard of three, four years ago. You know, Docker is the, the canonical example there. And Although they're essential, they're complicated. They're not the simplest of things to get your head around sometimes. And because they're new and exciting, they're not perhaps fully documented yet. So you know, they're version zero point something, but they're still useful. So people still want to get these things out there. And finally, they're there. There are instructions. Here's how to install it. Here's how to get it out onto your um, systems into your data center, but then you come to the day-to-day -day operations, the runtime management, and often that's that's an afterthought. So CloudSoft AMP is designed to solve some of these problems, make a few of these things easier. And the way it does that is modeling applications. So it lets you describe what your application will look like, describe the components it's built up of, and capture those in, in a blueprint. It can then deploy that, so instantiate that blueprint into a cloud or into a, a container ecosystem somewhere, into Docker, into uh, Amazon Web Services, into OpenStack, wherever. And then, once it's deployed, it can manage that deployed application. And so this isn't based on some particular, you know, you, particular piece of software. It's it's a generic capability. So um, understands how to sense properties. It can go and talk to REST APIs. It can run um, command line commands over SSH and pull back attributes, find out what's going on with your software. 
and then make changes to that. So manage it. If perhaps you know the CPU load is too high in a cluster, it can scale that out, or if things around you scale them down. Um, it lets you make changes to software um, as it's running, and we can do this pretty much anywhere that, that we have a supported um, driver for. So we use um, most public clouds. Um, there are examples there, OpenStack, um, software, Azure, Amazon Web Services. So we can deploy to public clouds. We can deploy to private clouds, so your VMwares, the OpenStacks, and, and um, Cloud Foundries. Um, they can be on physical infrastructure, so bare metal machines that you simply have credentials for, or virtualized, so again, your, your VMwares and your OpenStacks. And this is completely separate to the application blueprint. So the application blueprint describes the app, and then we can send that off to any of these targets. And the things we can create there, we have built-in blueprints for well, there's a list, React, Nginx, Basho, multi-tier apps, you know, Elk Stack, um, all, all sorts of various useful open source components are available, and you can link those together and build them up into complex apps of your own, build in your own line of business software, your um, stuff written in Python, in Go, in Java, and include those, link those into your blueprint. So, once we have the application deployed using AMP, maybe you know, just onto some, some public cloud somewhere, we want to manage that at runtime. And I mentioned policies and doing things like scaling out and scaling down. So we use metrics that we pull back from the app and we can look at just properties of the, the machines that the um, application is deployed to or actual application specific things we dig into your database find transaction per second maybe we look at a web service find out the latency and we can use these metrics to decide what sort of actions to perform on your deployed application and these actions again they're, they're a specific library of actions so how to scale a cluster of things is not intrinsically dependent on what those things are so you can build up a scalable application out of individual components that you simply you pulled out of a catalog. So that it's quite a powerful capability and it lets you concentrate on designing the app rather than worrying about high availability policies and mechanisms and worrying about what sort of monitoring software. These are just components that can be added in to your blueprint. So this lets you use, uh, let's say, concentrate on the application more. It lets you think about how your your business is using the app. So you're not you're not worried about infrastructure, and that's that's I think the the important takeaway. You 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 design the app. You you think about the app. You don't worry about the underlying cloud. You don't worry about the underlying bare metal machines. We we take care of that. So, so long as you have a blueprint, you're, you're able to, to send that off to some cloud somewhere. And finally, as well as being able to deploy applications to the cloud, so that's all well and good deploying something like OpenShift, which is the, the, the first thing that we would need to do. But then the applications you're going to deploy, they're no longer going to the cloud, they're actually going to OpenShift. They're, they're containers, they're not software running on virtual machines. So AMP and Brooklyn are also able to deploy to container infrastructures. We're able to stand up a Kubernetes or a Docker Swarm, or as I'm going to show you, an OpenShift infrastructure, build that out, provision it, but then your applications that you want to run, AMP can also deploy those to OpenShift. So the OpenShift is then not just the thing you deploy, but it's also a target. And you can even construct applications where some part of them you know, is running a pod inside your OpenShift environment, and other components, you know, an Oracle database is running on a bare metal beeping machine sitting next to it in, in your data center. So 
we're able to deploy and deploy to containerized application environments. So I'd like to next show how we can apply all that to OpenShift, how we can deploy and manage an OpenShift cluster. So we want to deploy OpenShift into the cloud. We've got an account on AWS, or maybe we've got um, a private on-premise OpenStack environment. And it's pretty simple to work out what you need to do to stand up OpenShift because Red Hat provides Ansible and Ansible playbooks. But if you recall back at the beginning, one of the things that it's quite easy to do is to install an application, but then runtime management is something that is added on perhaps as an afterthought. So AMP is able to use Ansible for what it's good at. So you know, we don't pretend to know better than Red Hat how to deploy OpenShift. The, the canonical and best practices are, are described in the Ansible playbooks that are provided on GitHub by Red Hat. So we simply use them. And we can configure that. Um, is it, you know, quite a powerful configuration language, a powerful DSL that lets us describe how we want to build our cluster so we can configure all the component parts. But AMP is also then able to introspect into the deployed OpenShift and work and see you know, what's happening to these virtual machines in real time, um, what's happening to the OpenShift processes that are running, the, the Kubernetes components, the OpenShift, the Docker components. And we can build up some quite complex mechanisms to do some very useful things to this deployed cluster from some basic primitive actions, you know, like increase the number of nodes in a cluster or um, execute this command on this node of this cluster. So we take something, this is a very simple blueprint that describes how to deploy an OpenShift origin template. And this doesn't contain the, the nuts and bolts of the deployment, but is rather the configuration that is then fed into the Ansible playbook. So you can see the OpenShift version. You can see the size of the master cluster. There is two. We have three XTD machines, um, five nodes. So we're going to build a five node cluster and some specifications for the machines that we're going to create for these OpenShift nodes or a number of cores, a amount of RAM. So um, takes this and we have a nice graphical UI that lets us have a look at what, what we're deploying. So here you can see just exactly what was shown in that bit of YAML before, but perhaps in a, in a slightly friendlier fashion. So you can see there's our OpenShift cluster has been highlighted and you can see the table of, of um, properties down there to the left. And we would simply click deploy or you can save it to a catalog, but in this case, we're going to deploy that and we get a running application. So this is um, the part of the application that contains that five node cluster. So there are five OpenShift nodes there. You can see them with a the little OpenShift logo. And we can also look at the, the whole cluster. So there's a tree structure here. You can see there's also masters and the etcd part. Um, you know, we're not just creating a single entity that represents a cluster and that's it, it's an opaque black box. You can introspect right down into the individual machines. So I'm going to try and flip across and have a look at this live. So I'm not going to show it deploying because to be honest, that's quite boring. Um, you've got to sit and wait while Yum updates a whole bunch of packages. You've got to sit and wait while things are pulled down from remote repos. This is one that I've already deployed, and you can see the structure. Um, perhaps it's easier to start here. So we can see we have OpenShift origin. We have a little entity that manages our host files um, so that the individual machines can talk to each other. This can only, it could be replaced with a bind server if you wanted, but for the purposes of simple demos, I'm just using Etsy hosts. And we have an Ansible server that 
contains the link it pulled down the playbooks from GitHub and that's where we execute the commands to deploy and create this OpenShift origin cluster. And you can see the main the URI with our openshift.local, the private name, it's not actually in the public DNS. So if we drill down a little bit, we can see there's a load balancer, some masters, an etcd cluster, and some nodes. etcd, we have three of these. Um, the masters, it's, it's a pair of master servers and a single load balancer. And we've already seen the, the five node, OpenShift node cluster. So going back here, if I look at the individual OpenShift nodes, we can look at sensors. And what sensors are, they're the mechanism that AMP and Brooklyn use to pull data back from things that it's deployed, so they can then use them for runtime management. So you can see it's got the host address, which is, um, I'm doing this on a VPN, so they're all private 10 dot addresses rather than public. Um, there's information about where it installed software, and I'll pull back the whole YAML document that describes an OpenShift node status. And in fact, this can also be processed. So this is simply the first part. So th this is a YAML document showing we, we can read in here the, the 20 pod capacity, the amount of memory, and that can then be fed into policy that will extract out the correct, you know, perhaps the memory status, perhaps out of disk messages, it will extract those out and the policy can then decide, actually, I need to do something, this node is unhappy, I need to restart the service, I need to maybe delete it, shut down all the pods running on it and go and, go and start a new node. But we can see here OpenShift status, it's happy, it's running, services up. Um, this is it, it's a happy cluster. It's it's doing the right thing. Um, if we look at the master nodes, again we can see the same sort of thing, and we're pulling back information about versions of which particular bit of software ended up being installed by that Ansible um, Ansible playbook. Um, and the cluster itself, um, I'll just pop open the, the OpenShift console. So it's it's a pretty standard OpenShift. Um, we're running, yeah, we're running a single um, Redis pod on this, and I'll come back to that. But we're just running a single pod. It's it's not not doing anything particularly interesting at the moment. So that's our runtime managed and deployed OpenShift cluster. Their AMP has created all of this. Um, in fact, the final thing that I'll show is the activity going on and show where it came from. So we, we provisioned this on a blue box um, open, open stack environment. So AMP created the virtual machines, it provisioned them on OpenStack and it's then executed a series of actions, it's installed some software, customized it, and launched it. And then the same thing with our Ansible server, which goes, we provisioned an Ansible server, and it then executed the playbook, and the playbook turned all of these virtual machines into that running OpenShift cluster that, that you saw there on the, the console, uh, the OpenShift console UI. So, I'm going to leave that there for the moment. We'll come back to this um, AMP runtime um, management and actually execute some runtime commands on it. But I'd like to explain a bit more about how, how that actually works first. So I'm going to move on to automation and describe how we can automate actions in OpenShift. So not just deploying, but this is automating tasks that you might want to do while the cluster is running. So we want to monitor the cluster activity. So I mentioned policies that look at, say, the number of pods. So suppose I have five nodes. Um, they're, they're configured for a maximum of 10 pods each. I'd need to monitor and you know, perhaps once I hit some low watermark, um, say you know, 40 pods, I know that 
actually I'm going to run out of space soon because I'm going to hit my limit of 50, so I need to do something about that. So <clears throat> the, the first thing we need to do is monitor the cluster, look at these sensors, look at the properties of the cluster and pull them back into policies that can do something useful. Then we need to actually do that useful thing, so adding new nodes. And that's reasonably simple for AMP because, well, you saw it can deploy to the cloud. So adding a new node to the cluster, well, we simply provision a new virtual machine. And helpfully, um, Red Hat have provided further playbooks for Ansible that we can use to extend the cluster. So there is not just a playbook for deploying, there are playbooks to scale up and scale down. So AMP is able to orchestrate those and execute these further playbooks or scale out when it needs to. Um, other things we might need to do, we might need to replace machines. So perhaps you know, a process has failed, maybe you know, the disk has failed, maybe there's a bad network connection. We don't know, but our, our cluster of five has become a cluster of four. So to regain that capacity, we'd need to, again, it's it's the equivalent of adding a new node. It's just, when does it happen? So it, we monitor, we monitor for failures, and we do, we replace the failed machines and either delete the failed ones or keep them and investigate later, you know, what was it that happened? Was it, you know, someone hacking in? Was it just a dead on arrival machine or you know, some natural cosmic rays, something like that? So, and we can grow the cluster. Um, so, adding new nodes when we need to because there's excessive load, but perhaps we also want to anticipate that so we can provide a policy that follows the sun, so to speak. That, um, nine till five we increase the size of our cluster because we know that's when most of the jobs are running five o'clock happens we scale it back down to some minimal level and we're not wasting money we're not spending you know our amazon compute bill is not growing enormously with when we're doing nothing with the cluster and finally we might want to update the machines in the cluster we might want to update the operating system we might want to deploy patches or perform some kind of operational maintenance of the underlying infrastructure and hopefully do this without upsetting customers that are using the cluster without affecting the applications. We, we simply want to make sure we have the right type of you know, the right security patches. We're up to date with the latest services running on our cluster. So these are all the, the things that we'd like to do. And the way we do this, we do this with effectors. Um, so the AMP blueprint creates that tree structure of entities that you saw. So we, we have the cluster, we, it has children, it has five children, there are the, the nodes running in there. And each of those nodes has not just the sensors defined on it, but it also has effectors. So these effectors, there are ways to perform tasks, so each entity can have certain tasks performed on it, and for which task you perform is based on the type of entity. So it, there are some things it makes sense to do on an OpenShift node, there are some things it makes sense to do on the master, and other things that it only makes sense to do on, say, the Ansible server. So only the Ansible server understands how to run the scale out <laughs> playbook, whereas starting and stopping the OpenShift process that's running a node, well, that only makes sense to happen on the OpenShift node. Or management of pods, that only makes sense, well, it's the masters that would be able to do that, perhaps running OC um, command line commands or executing some HTTP REST API request against the master or against the load balancer. And resizing of the cluster as well, the thing that knows how to do that is the, the cluster component itself. It, it knows how to add another one of the things that it is managing a cluster of. So the master cluster understands how to add a new master. The node cluster can add a new OpenShift node and, and so forth. So all of these effectors are defined on these individual nodes and they perform you know, sometimes simple actions, sometimes a little bit more complex. 
But in general, um, and I'll show you an example here, this is the definition from the actual underlying blueprint. And it's just, it's a YAML file. It describes the structure, that tree structure, but it also describes these effectors, these actions. And this one, it happens to be selecting the oldest nodes. But you can see the underlying way it does that. It's simply an OC command, and we've worked out the correct parameters to pass in. We want the K oldest nodes, so we pass in this $K. Now, and we can build up some quite complex things from just very simple components. So we, we can define on nodes all of these little effectors that do various quite simple things, but you then get a very powerful capability out of that because you, you can compose them together. So select all those nodes, once we've selected them, well, maybe we want to do something with them. And in fact, the evergreening, the, the whole evergreening process is simply, it's a composition of a lot of these very small vectors, these primitive actions pulled together and bundled together to perform you know, useful operational actions on your cluster and you know evergreen is just one of those this is you know it's just an example you know you could do pretty much anything you wanted so we're able to combine these tasks like select the oldest and we can do different things we could say sequence some tasks so do a then b then c great we could compose them together so do a take its output and feed that into b take b's output Feed that into C. Um, looping, you know, so, so here's a list of nodes, just do X to each of them, maybe X is you know, restart the service. So we loop through the list of nodes, restarting the service. Choices, you know, um, if the service is unhealthy, then do X, otherwise do Y. Transformations and replacements, so we can transform the content or the output of some command. Maybe we get the output to an IP address and we want to find the host name, something like that. So all of these little compositional mechanisms can be used to build these useful tasks. So that, that's how, in fact, that's how we build a task like WePave. So we want to keep our cluster fresh and um, let's say the, the phrase that you're evergreen the cluster. So we do that and we use simple primitive components and AMP lets us build those up into a task like Repave. So what exactly do I mean by Repave and evergreening? Um, so if you're not familiar with it, evergreening is the process of making sure that your cluster doesn't get stale, that the operating systems, that the patch sets, that the security hot fixes that are deployed, that you're always up to date. So one way of doing that, one way of evergreening your cluster is to repave nodes. So repaving is basically, it's, it's a simple set of steps laid out here. So we resize our cluster. So we've got say five nodes, we resize it. So we've got six and that sixth node is going to be created using a fresh operating system. And when we do the update, you know, we call an update command, it's going to pull down the latest security patches. It's going to pull down the latest packages. So we're, we know that when we create a new virtual machine, we get the fresh operating system, the fresh patch set and the fresh packages that we need to update the cluster. But that's just the virtual machine. So Yes, we've resized the cluster. We've got a new fresh VM that's got the latest set of hot fixes on it. We then need to scale out OpenShift, so scale out onto this new VM. And that's where Ansible comes into play. Ansible helps us by giving us the scale out playbook. And we kick that off. And the new fresh virtual machine becomes an OpenShift node. But now we've got a six node or you know, we've got a bigger cluster than we want it. So that's where that select oldest little task that I showed you comes in. We want to get rid of some of the old nodes because we don't need them anymore. We've got a nice new fresh one. So we find the oldest and then we run the OpenShift commands and we say, let's stop these nodes, take them out of the cluster, stop all the tasks on them. So 
they're running some pods, they're running some processes. We stop those processes, stop the pods, or rather tell OpenShift to do that, and OpenShift will helpfully stop them and restart them on some machine that actually has space for them. So OpenShift will drain tasks and move them over to hopefully our new virtual machine. And we can then get rid of these stop nodes that aren't running anything anymore and are just taking up space, taking up CPU and memory in our cluster and adding to our monthly bill on AWS. So that lets us repave a single node or perhaps a couple of nodes. And if we want to make sure our entire <laughs> cluster is, is evergreen, we simply schedule this. We say, let's run this. We've got an end node cluster. Let's run it n times. So five node cluster, we'll run it five times once a week. And that five times will clean up one node at a time. And our cluster every week, we know it's evergreen. And if there's a problem, well, we can stop after the first one. We can say, oh, OK, you know, there's something wrong with this. And we can roll back. And we're not going to, you know, the, the cluster is not going to crash and burn because we just changed everything all at once. It's a, a similar, similar mechanism to, say, blue-green deployments. The, the same sort of concept. We're doing one at a time and making sure that, yes, that was OK, and we can carry on. So I'm going to kick off a demo of this and show you how Repave actually works. So first off, um, here are the effectors. So we have Repave cluster on the OpenShift origin, but I'm not actually going to use that because what this would do, it would repave all five of the machines, all five of these OpenShift nodes, and that's going to take a bit more time than we've got available to us. So instead, we can execute the repave nodes, which is sitting here, and repave nodes simply repaves you know, K. Um, where k is some parameter, and we could repave a single node, and that will happen a bit faster. And actually, this is a good place to look because you can see in this list of effectors the things that an Ansible server can do. You can see that the Ansible server knows how to scale out, scale out nodes. It knows how to stop machines, how to update nodes. And if we look further at the master, we'll find that the other things I talked about, disabling scheduling, evacuating nodes, selecting oldest, they all live on the OpenShift master because it's able to run OpenShift commands across the entire cluster. So before we go and start our repave, what I'd like to do, here's our OpenShift console. So we're going to flip to the OpenShift web console. I've got a demo project, as you saw before, and here's our Redis. So let's look at the deployment. So there's only one replica there. What I'd like to do before this is to scale this up to five, because we've got five nodes. So now I go applications, deployment, application, sorry, application pods, yes. So we can see we had our initial running Redis, and we're going to have five um, Redis services running. Um, and if I pop to the command line, let's hit our list of nodes. So we can see here's all our nodes that I started this cluster an hour ago. And I'm also going to look at the list of pods. And we can see here's our one, two, three, five pods. Um, is it five? Yes. So we can actually look and we can see the pods running. And you can see they're each running on a separate node. So we'll leave this up here, um, this, oops, and go back to our AMP. So as I said, we'd like to repave, but we'd like to just repave a single node. So let's invoke this. I'm going to set that to one and confirm. So that started the repave process. And if we look, there you go, there is, it's scaling up, it's resizing, and look at what's happening with resize nodes, it's, it's calling, it's asking 
OpenStack for a new virtual machine, and it's then going to run through, it's going to um, run the Ansible playbook, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I don't think it, it's perhaps less instructive to watch this as I have a sort of visual diagram that shows perhaps more clearly how exactly this is all happening. So we started with the initial OpenShift cluster. Um, you can see there are nodes, each node's running Docker Engine and OpenShift, and we have pods. Okay, there's a lot more pods running here than on my little demo cluster, but you see the light green ones. So there's some application that is spread across all five nodes. So first thing that happens is AMP resizes that cluster. And in this case, it adds two more nodes. So we see those at the right, and these are what I talked about, the, the evergreen, the fresh nodes with the fresh security patches and so on. We know they're updated. Then we move on to Ansible. So Ansible has the scale out playbook and it's um, telling Ansible, execute this playbook that causes these fresh nodes to have Docker Engine and OpenShift deployed onto them. So we've now gone from five to seven nodes and are now running a seven node OpenShift cluster. But we don't want two of these. So we need to find a couple of the oldest ones. And it so happens, these are the ones we've run dotted lines around them. So AMP is able to run that little bit of shell command that I showed you, and it selected the two oldest OpenShift nodes. So next we want to stop anything further being deployed to those. Those they're the old ones, we're going to get rid of them. So we turn off scheduling, which is again a single command. And then after that, we drain the pods from those nodes. So you can see the dotted lines, we've gotten rid of the pods running on these old nodes, and OpenShift has helpfully started them up on the new nodes that we created. And this is all possible, I mean, if you remember the way OpenShift likes things to happen, you know, you're running stateless pods, you're running stateless images, so we can stop and start and move things around, and our end users are going to be none the wiser. They're, they're going to see their application continue working, you know, they still have capacity, there's no lost transactions, nothing to worry about like that. As long as your applications are built you know, as stateless, stateless microservices, stateless um, applications, OpenShift is able to juggle them around as it sees fit and move these pods to the latest, freshest nodes that it finds in the system. Because of course, it can't schedule anything anymore to these old, <coughs> the nodes with the, the dotted lines around them. So then AMP comes in again. So AMP has told OpenShift, let's reschedule these pods to another node. We then turn off the OpenShift process. We don't need OpenShift anymore. So SSH is in, AMP stops the processes. There is nothing happening anymore. Those processes are, are no longer of any interest to us. But we still have the virtual machines. So last task, AMP needs to go and release those virtual machines, put them back into the pool. Maybe it's OpenStack, we get rid of them, we just say shut down. Maybe it's AWS, but you know, essentially they were just taking up space. They're taking up CPU from our pool of CPU. They're um, causing it, you know, increasing our Amazon Web Services bill, our Azure bill, whatever. So we release those virtual machines, they disappear, and we're left with repaved OpenShift cluster. Now, this is simply two, and you should, you know, if, if you imagine we do this perhaps one at a time, or we do it once more, but say set the parameter to three, we end up with five node cluster. Every virtual machine has been renewed, replaced, and our applications are still running quite happily, our pods are still quite happy, and our end users are none the wiser, and yet they have a more secure, a more up-to-date piece of underlying infrastructure. So we, we've been able to do all this to improve our infrastructure without inconveniencing the end users running applications there. 
Now, I'm not sure how much I can take a note with the time when I, I started running through that little animation. So let's see. Ah, OK, no, that's looking good. So we've resized the nodes. We then updated them. So our select oldest happened. We did a bit of bookkeeping, converting the string to a list. And we then stopped the oldest ones. Let's go back. And then we actually stopped the machines those were running on. So a bit of bookkeeping again, resized by delta. So that resizes by minus one. And what that does, it says, let's throw away the machines that, that are unwanted. So that would be any machine that, that had OpenShift stopped on it. So that's happened. We can see we've still got five nodes in our cluster. It's it's not actually immediately intuitively visible here what's happened. So I'm going to flip across back to our command line. So let's look at two things. I'm going to run that get pods command again. And we can see, there we go, seven minutes old, seven minutes old, seven minutes old, three older pods. And we have two, one, uh, one minute old. Uh, what, what did I run that with? Uh, yes, I ran it with a size of one. So that there was the initial pod that we started. Then I scaled it out to five, which are these seven minute old pods. And then there was this brand new one, which has just been started. So this is the, the pod that got moved onto the new evergreen node. And in fact, if we look at the list of nodes, we can see that, yes, they're all one hour old, except here's our dot one four six. And yep, that's exactly right. That new node is what our brand new pod is running on. So we can see that one node has vanished. A new one has been created two minutes ago. And the pods have been shuffled around. And our application still has five replicas. It's, it's still quite, quite happily running there. Um, you ought to be able to see um, if we look at our console. In fact, yes, we can see. So there's our two minutes old, this this little, little Redis running here. So activities. And the only other thing that might be a bit useful to go into here is, yes, we can do that manually, and that's great. But we want to do this automatically. So here's our list of things that happened. But if I look at policies, we see periodic effector. And this periodic effector is running, it's repaving two nodes every day. Um, or we could repave the entire cluster. We could run this um, repave cluster once a week. Um, the, the, the principle is that we're able to execute these effectors automatically these effectors in turn run a sequence of further primitive commands so resizing starting stopping scaling out and that happens on some kind of scheduled scheduled policy scheduled um, um, program so i'm gonna pop back to the slides now and can I just summarize what we've seen here and why it's useful. So first off, we talked about AMP and what AMP can do. So AMP lets you manage your applications, grow your applications, scale them dynamically, depending on the workload. It gives you a common management platform. So that mechanism that we saw to manage OpenShift infrastructure is exactly the same front end and API and user interface that would be used to manage applications running on OpenShift. So completely the same piece of tooling, completely agnostic. So although we uh, across platforms, so although we ran it on OpenStack there, it could run on AWS, it could run on um, private or public cloud, it doesn't matter, it can also run on containerized platforms. And finally, it's a simple and consistent management mechanism, and it lets you build up from simple components into <laughs> complex apps using a library of effectors and actions and a library of entities and templates and blueprints. So you can orchestrate not just your 
application and the mechanism for deploying your application, but also the, the operations that happen to your application at runtime. So we're able to deploy OpenShift Origin. We then are able to, and I, I didn't really show this, but we're able to deploy applications to OpenShift in the same way that we can deploy OpenShift itself. We can manage a running OpenShift, so look at the running virtual machines, look at the properties of those virtual machines, and we can orchestrate actions across the whole application. So we can make things happen, um, the repave of an entire cluster, and use that to evergreen OpenShift. So with this mechanism, we can deploy OpenShift and make sure that at all times we have the latest version of whatever security patches and fixes are, are required. And this all happens automatically and in the background. And I just add that of course we you know this is no solution or no alternative to you know Heartbleed comes out and you've got to fix everything immediately. Or, or you know we're not recommending that oh it's okay it'll be repaved next week. But you can use the same mechanism. You know, we could simply have, oh, you know, Heartbleed is out, um, right? We need to get the latest hotfix. Well, I can just click on the repave effector and repave now. I don't need to wait one week. So, you know, we can either automate the management, it happens on schedule, or we can instigate those actions and execute them whenever we want as, as operators. So, um, that's essentially it. Um, hopefully that made things a bit clearer. Hopefully you understand how OpenShift evergreening can be accomplished and how we can deploy and manage OpenShift using CloudSoft AMP to talk to Ansible and talk to OpenShift. So I guess are there questions? Um, well, I think, I think I have, I have a couple, just maybe clarification. Okay. Um, which and and I'm um, I'm thrilled that we finally captured all of this information, and I can't wait to get the feedback from people who are using it and and what they think of this approach. Um, I think it solves a lot of problems. I'm um, and this I have to say, for me, this was the first time I heard the the, the phrase repave. I've heard evergreen before, but repave is is it was new to me. But um, Duncan, I think it was. Introduced by Pivotal, um, they, they first talked about it, if I recall correctly. So it, it's an interesting concept. Um, my question is, you talked a lot about stateless apps, and um, OpenShift uh, leverages uh, Kubernetes persistent volume, the PV framework, to allow administrators to pers provision provision mm. persistent, persistent storage for clusters. Um, and I'm wondering how all of this repaving works, um, or if you've tried it, um, with things that have um, PVCs or volume claims. Um, right. Yeah, so I don't know if you noticed, but I did, I'm not going to say cheat, but I, I the Redis I deployed was the Redis with ephemeral storage. I didn't choose the persistent volume. And it, it, essentially, you wouldn't want to use, you know, localized volumes, but you can repave if you're using volumes that are coming from an external Ceph cluster or something like that, then there's no problem at all because Kubernetes and Tens OpenShift are smart enough to restart the pod somewhere else and reconnect that volume from your SAN. Um, yeah, if you were using local storage, of course, you, you, you've got a problem. Your app is going to have a bad time because when it starts <laughs> up, it can't find any of its data. But I think so long as you follow best practices and you, everything sh should be okay. And that's one of the next steps that I'd like to work on with this OpenShift deployment. You'll, you'll notice that it didn't contain a deployment of a SAN. So there, there wasn't um, a storage cluster deployed there. So I think that would be the next step is to modify the blueprint to deploy a storage cluster and make sure that we can repave and you know, redeploy the <coughs> applications connected to you know, volumes on that storage cluster, and also think about what to do to repave and um, update the, the machines that are actually running the storage cluster, because you, you, know, you have to worry about mirroring 
and availability of your storage, and that, that's another exciting problem. So yeah, yeah that, that think there, things there's to... lots of exciting, exciting problems out there. You know, uh, where I'm, I'm hoping that some of you guys will be coming to Red Hat Summit in Boston, um, and we'll pop into the OpenShift Commons gathering on the day before at May May first in Boston, because there'll be a lot of um, real world production scale customers talking. I think we have nine or ten of them now. Um, who are going to talk about their stack and their their implementations of OpenShift, um, and it would be good to to see because I think that the, the use of PVCs and and persistent storage clusters is 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 on the rise, and um, that's that's something that's going to be interesting for people um, mm -hmm. who are using this approach to to make sure that they manage correctly. Um, there is one other question um, here, and I. Um, uh, and I'm also uh, interested in this too, and I think probably it's it's new to you too. But if, if Dale is asking if he if you've attempted um, this with an OpenShift upgrade Ansible playbook, and um, uh, to to run the upgrade playbook, no. But that is one of the things I had in in mind as being one of the the capabilities of these these effectors. So yeah, absolutely, that's. A further effector that would be quite simple to design based on you know, the work that's been done here. Yeah, instead of calling scale out, we call upgrade, and we move from the you know, OpenShift origin, whatever, to the next next release. Yeah, that's. I think it, that would be the, infinitely useful to to have um, and have it tested and have those um, have that implemented here because that really because with Kubernetes being on a three month re release cycle. And, and OpenShift Origin being rapidly coming up on its heels. I think we're always one point behind because we take three months to secure and scale and test um, the, our projection versions of these. Um, but that, I think, um, the upgrading um, process is something that is always top of mind for everyone who's in operations um, using OpenShift pretty much anywhere. Uh, yeah, 100% agree. I mean, that's basically it is one of the next things on our to-do list with this. So, yeah, you're, you're evidently we're looking in the right direction, so that's good to know. And, yeah, hopefully we could come back and yeah, demonstrate the, the upgrade once, we, once we've done that. Yeah, good. We're also, Dan, we're also looking for people to work with us on this. So rather than us just going off doing something, coming back, you know, another show and tell, if there are people, Dale, or whomever that wants to, Kind of came up with Andrew. Certainly, would be very keen to support that. Yeah, no, I, I think that'd be it'd be interesting, and that's kind of why I'm thinking that um, you should, if you're not coming to Red Hat Summit um, or the OpenShift gathering at Red Hat, because there's I think over 80, 80 sessions um, that are really just people who are using it in production, and and their their feedback would I think inform um, and. They'll they'll have some real world use for um, this approach, I I believe. So I think it'd be a good good time to to get together and, and introduce you to some of these folks. Is there a link you can just post for us about the yeah. gathering, or am I just yeah. behind the curve here? That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm I'm losing my voice a little bit because I've been talking all morning too. Not I, I got to listen to Andrew for a change, but um. Uh -huh. yeah, if you go to oh, Commons, I found it. I found the link. Got it. Yes, yeah, commons.openshift.org slash gathering. Um, we do three of them a year, two at each KubeCon, and now one the day before every Red Hat Summit. And we love. I, I think I really think you ought to be in the room and and, and be part of that conversation because that's where you're going to find people like Dale and others um, mm -hmm. to help you out with this. And um, I'll, I'll I'll shoot you guys a note and um, I'll. A code so that you can register um, with a promo code, and then if anybody else wants to, um, I'm happy to, to get you in the door. If you so, could, that'd be great, and we can talk internally about whether we can maybe parachute Andrew in or something, because I think it would be good. Yeah, that'd be good. Because I, I also uh, think that it's the face-to-face -face time that really makes the difference. Yeah. We do a lot of these briefings. Um, I do, and I, and there's tons of people who 
to watch them afterwards and people who joined us today and I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I wish you would ask a few more questions. But um, today, I think Andrew did a very good job. So maybe that's why there's not so many questions. But um, I think we've got a lot of uh, a, a lot of good synergies here, and this is something that's very useful. And it, it and for me, I think today is the first time, um, Andrew, and I think you did a really good job of it, at explaining the value proposition for what you're doing at CloudSoft. So um, it was a very, very good demo. So thanks. No, thank you, and thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been good. So, um, and I'll obviously send the slides to you so that anyone who wants them will be able to download them from the relevant place at the relevant time. Um, yeah. And, the, and as I, I said at the beginning, all of these will be up on our YouTube channel for open page open shift on YouTube. Um, and I am behind a few, as some of you know. Um, I usually post each of them as a blog, and um, I've been caught up in a few other things, so I'm behind about three or four um, sessions. So I will get these up um, hopefully by the end of the week, um, even the backlog, and they'll be up on blog.openshift.org. Um, or dot com rather, they'll be there soon. So thanks again, Andy. This was really a great demo, and I think very useful for um, getting uh, a good overview of what what you're doing at CloudSoft and, and, and where you've done where you've gone with Apache Brooklyn. Um, the last time I saw a demo, it's quite quite impressive. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Great. Thank you.